Will you be standing in this election? Yes, I will. Yes. Where are you going to stand? Um, do you know, I'm actually not sure yet. Uh, I know Why is there a... so much prevarication? You're not sure, the leader Paul Nuttall's not sure. No, I mean, look, the whole thing has happened very fast. I think you grant us that. I do. So, uh, in fact, we you know we have to sort of think quite clearly about where we stand and what we're going to do. So, or yes, where I'm... you might have a vague chance in actually winning. Well, the thing is, is that in the last election, as you said, we got four million votes from one mm. MP. And now you have none. And we were a bit scattergun in our approach, maybe then. But that has changed. I mean, first of all, we've been organising on the ground much more over those past two years. We've got a much greater sense of where we're strong and where we're not. So we are going to be targeting much more in particular seats where we are strong. Right. So are you going to stand in London, do you think? Um, probably not. I think it'll be just maybe outside London, in the South East. But I'm just weighing up a few things, I mean, at the moment. So um, we all are. But it, over this weekend, things will become much clearer. Right. What about South Thanet? where Nigel Farage tried last time? Um, I, no, I don't think I'll, it'll be there. But no? uh, you, know, you can press me as much as you like, but I'm, I'm basically just going to have a think about it and, uh, it, and uh, you know, make sure that we're absolutely right about where we're going to go. Yes, I mean, it is a bit strange. I mean, all right, you're standing... Really? You, well, hang on, you're standing, but you don't know uh, where yet. Suzanne Evans, another leading figure, isn't standing. Uh, well, Nigel Farage... No, I, she did a, I, she did I a great that. job of it last time, she's doing let, it again this time. Let me finish the question. Uh, Nigel Farage isn't standing, and, as I say, we still don't know from Paul Nuttall, who didn't seem to want to talk to journalists at all. It sounds a bit like you're scared of the electorate because you just don't think you have a chance of winning any seats. The electorate, the last people we're scared of. I mean, the thing is, is that you, you know, you, bless you in the media, you sort of try <laughs> to put the agenda all the time and put the kind of time... That's our on. job. That is your job. But, uh, no, look, it will become quite clear. I know Paul's making an announcement uh, this weekend too, so... Right, OK. I mean, since the referendum, UKIP have been at pains to identify themselves um, as more than a party yeah. of Brexit, yeah. that you have much more to offer. And yet you've agreed to stand aside in particular areas, so long as another party's candidates, mainly uh, Tories, uh, have a long-standing Brexiteer. Mm -hmm. I mean, doesn't that just show you you aren't really anything more than Brexit? No, not at all. I mean, first of all, right, we're going to be standing all over the country. Mm -hmm. When you talk about seats where we're actually going to be standing aside for whether it's Tory or Labour, it actually comes down to a very small amount. But the thing is that these are people who maybe have spent their whole lives doing what we've been doing in trying to get the proper, strong, complete Brexit. Right. So but beyond that, as I'm saying, that you obviously haven't got that much to offer, otherwise you would stand on your own ticket. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, when we talked about migration before, we were a one-issue party, supposedly. Before that, it was Europe. This week, obviously, people have been going, uh, kicking off about, uh, in the media, about what we said on Monday, about the worker and about integration. I mean, of course, the thing is, what we're doing in UKIP is moving from a position of being purely maybe about Brexit at one point, yes, to a domestic party. Right. right. And so, therefore... What we said on Monday and indeed what you're going to see throughout the rest of the campaign are very strong announcements on all aspects of uh, policy in Britain and not just about the EU. But of course, this is, to an extent, the Brexit election. So uh, we have got to be absolutely certain that people get what they voted for last year. Right. I mean, Paul Nuttall said 350 candidates have been selected um, and the total number won't be too dissimilar from the 600 in 2015. Right, yes. Will it be closer to 350 or 600? I think probably you fall somewhere in the middle there, probably about, I, I, I'd say, certainly nearer to the 600 mark. Right. I mean, Is that because you haven't quite got the resources that you're not going to feel quite as many? I mean, where does the money for UKIP come no, from these days? Look, a lot of, a lot of the... Uh, in terms of uh, our candidates, a lot of this is about the fact that Theresa May cynically uh, announced an election with six, you know, what, seven weeks or whatever, quite cynically putting the fortunes of the Tory party above anything else, which is something we never do, by the way, in, in UKIP. And so, therefore, obviously, it's been quite quick. We've had to do this quite quick. But uh, we are, you know, we're fine in terms of money. We are secure financially. Um, and so, you know, we're going to go forward and uh, I think it'll, uh, it'll be an exciting campaign. All right. I mean, you talked about the, the domestic policies. Well, let's talk about one of them, which is the ban on the burqa. Um, and as you know, uh, your main donor, or certainly he was your main donor, Aaron Banks, said it was like going to war on the Muslim religion. What well, he's wrong. Him? He's totally wrong. First of all, he's wrong uh, also on the actual saying this is about going to... We're not going to war on Muslims at all. This is an integration agenda, first of all. How is it about integration if you're telling women what to wear? The fact is, is that the full face covering, this is not the headscarf, this is not any other form, just the full face covering, right, is a literal 
ba uh, ba barrier to integration. It is something which has been banned in France, something which has been banned in Belgium. Indeed, the biggest uh, party in the European Parliament has just recommended that there should be an EU-wide ban on it. There is a growing public unease about this. And the fact is that also it's a real living symbol of female subjugation. And it's amazing that, you know, when it's actually put forward that this is something which, you know, you, we're telling women what to wear. In many Middle Eastern countries, there have been long-standing campaigns so that women are freed from this kind of restrictive... Right, but I mean... in liberal democracies, is it put forward in that way? So why is it alienating key people in your own party? I mean, it wasn't just Aaron Banks. James Carver, uh, the member of the European Parliament, said he strongly disagreed. He said it was misguided, that no-one has the right to dictate what people should well, wear. And I feel this policy undermines my desire to represent all communities within the West Midlands, the area that he has represented. Does I, he not have a point? I don't, ag I don't agree with uh, Jim over that. And, and also, the fact is, we're not a whipped party, right? So we're, that's always been one of our strengths. You know, OK, it means people can speak out, whatever. When it comes to Aaron Banks, for example, and what Jim has said, the point is, is that the full face worker, and for that matter, FGM, they are not in the Quran, they are not religious practices, they are cultural ones. Right, but you say it's not about Muslims, but it sounds all about Muslims. No, but in in the case, no, no, for example, FGM is not solely uh, an is. Uh, but the Burqa ban is. The fact is, is that when it comes to that, it is not actually something that is ordained by the Quran, and we are actually behind the curve uh, compared to many countries on that. Jenny Russell, despite the fact that there has been some uh, internal opposition to it, Paul Nuttall reiterated, restated the commitment to the Burqa ban. That policy says it came from the grassroots. Do you think it is a popular policy? For UKIP popular, supporters? Popular amongst UKIP supporters or, or amongst people they hope to attract? Well, both. Well, they're only at 7% in the polls. Um, I th I'm sure it will appeal to some people, but I think that UKIP's major problem is that it was about two things, a cause and a charismatic leader. They've lost their cause. That's been hijacked now by the Tories who are going for Brexit. And they've lost their charismatic leader. No, no, and I don't think... Points. I don't... I don't you have lost your charismatic leader, I'm afraid, if, you, if you're maintaining that no, no. Paul Nuttall's the same thing as Nigel Farage. And... Basically, that's why they've sunk in the polls and that's why they're desperately trying to draw attention to themselves now. Right, you know, and if you look at some of the I polls... I must come back on this. When you say the type of people we're going to attract and all the kind of implications of that... No, the, well, what are the implications? implications? No, no, I'm just you, talking you, about the kinds the, of people the burka, who, who ban might on the be burka, interested in voting for you. A ban on the burqa is supported by voters of every single political party, including the Lib Dems, right, in this country. That is how far uh, public opinion has moved and how... What are the percentages for the support from those parties, then, for that? I think, it, it, obviously, in, my, in, in UKIP, it is it's huge. It's about 84%. Mm, well, I think well. with the, in the Tory party, it's about 60-something. And then you come down in the 40s to Labour, and then, obviously, much less in the Lib Dems. But the point is, I mean, they I are don't... majorities. Right. Well, let's have a look at the polls. Um, yeah. Jenny has raised them. I mean, even the Lib Dems are now ahead of you. It does look as if this election is going to be where UKIP crashes and burns. No. No, no, no. Look, seven percent. The Lib Dems are on ten percent. Yes, I, I know. But look, we've got six weeks to go. I'm, I'm very, you know, I'm very touched by your, your, your face still in the polls after all the things that happened last year. Um, but we've actually they still get most of the polls right over well, periods of time. It's true they have had some key ones that have been yeah. wrong in the past. What do you think, uh, though, as, as the sort of chances of success for UKIP? I mean, all right, let's put the polls aside for once. But looking realistically, um, Nigel Farage has gone. Uh, as we know, Paul Nuttall is the new leader. There had been a huge amount of turbulence. Um, Brexit, it seems, is happening. Um, and so what is the point? I would dearly love to see one or two UKIP MEP, uh, M MPs rather, in, in Parliament, partly to hold the uh, Theresa May's feet to the fire, as, the, as they say, and partly to talk about issues that the Conservatives are not addressing at the moment, like, like social cohesion. Um, nevertheless, I do regretfully say that I don't think UKIP are going to win many, if any, seats. And I think that's, that's rather sad. But it's, it's unfortunately a function of the fact that Theresa May has, has um, nailed her cards to the marks. She is, she is mm. Brexit. It means Brexit. And unfortunately, UKIP is still associated, like it or not, with, with leaving the European Union. So no, no, its no, job I, is done. I don't agree at all. all I think you'll be surprised. Um, I think, as I said, the big difference this time is that, you know, voter share is one thing, yes, and it probably won't be as high as it was last time. But the fact is, is that there are no prizes for coming second with the first past the post. And so, therefore, we do know that this time. And we have been much more focused on a number of seats. So I think that actually you could be surprised. What um, level do you think? I'm sorry? 
What, what about the number of seats? What level do you think you'll get then? It's hard to say at the moment, but I mean, the thing is, is that we had the one, but I th certainly think I would like to see, get us, uh, uh, we will be targeting maybe around about six particular places. All right. And, uh, and I think that therefore, you know, and also, of course, there are other, we've got a secondary layer of seats that we're going to go for too. So. Right. I mean, it, the, the, the reality, though, um, as John Curtis, the sophologist, said, is that the UKIP vote is going to the Tories. Do you accept that, that there is a shift? I mean, not only is there a shift in personnel going to the Tories, is, as we've seen, but there is also a shift uh, amongst voters, and that's the story of the first week of the campaign, he says. Well, it is only the first week of the campaign. I accept the, that. The, the personnel that have gone were always going to, you know, basically they're just, you know, they joined us and piggybacked on us for a while and gone back to where they should always have been. That is for sure. They're, they are not uh, missed at all. Um, but I think the thing is, what will become clear to people, it's already becoming clear, is that, for example, on a big issue like migration, where people absolutely do trust and believe that we say what we mean, right? There is nothing coming from the government. This will become quite clear. All right. that basically, immigration control, immigration levels will stay the same for about 10 years after actually we leave. That is going to become clearer over the next six weeks. Peter Whittle, thank, thank you. you.